I am now recording. Uh, because we want everyone to have the information, uh, we go through a lot of scriptures. Uh, and the reason that we do that is uh, we don't base anything on our opinion. Um, and with that said, we need to also understand that there is only one interpretation of scriptures. It's not what I think it says or what you think it says. If you go to the original text in which the language was written, whether it be Hebrew or Greek, um, it tells you exactly what God was saying when he wrote the word. Now, there are many translations. Translation is translating from one um, language to another. That's not the same as interpretation. Interpretation is uh, having a precise uh, understanding of what the scriptures actually says, and that's one of the biggest problems in the religious circles. Uh, there are people that believe that there are more than one interpretation because uh, a lot of times you can be talking to people and they'll say, well, that's the way you see it. Um, that's not the way it is. It's not the way I see it or the way that you see it. God has spoken his word, word very plainly, and he's spoken it one way. And that's what we base everything that we do on, uh, the written word of God, which will require you to be a student of the word to understand what I'm talking about when we're talking about the Greek text and the Hebrew text, understanding what God uh, meant when he wrote the word. So last week uh, we talked about reprogramming our minds. Uh, our, object, we, uh, real, our objective was uh, to live in obedience to the word of God. The goal was to live a life of righteousness characterized by the abundant life. Um, we also talked about how there are a lot of saints committed to righteousness. Uh, which is characterized by a life of personal holiness through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we're here. We're here for those that are truly committed to righteous living. Uh, it's not for everyone, even though God has called all of us to live to that level. But um, God also says my people are destroyed daily for lack of knowledge. Uh, me personally, I want to enjoy all that God has for us on this side. We looked at some of the strategies that we are going to be going into. But I left you with a question last week. That question was, are you committed to making the sacrifices necessary to live a righteous lifestyle? Or are you going to be content with living a mediocre life for those of us that are? Uh, and because you are here tonight, uh, I'm assuming that you're here because you are really interested in moving into the highest level of living on this side that you can for God. And with that said, we want to go into that process tonight, and we want to start off with um, faith working in love. We're going to start the process of how do we move forward to live this righteous life that glorifies God. How do we move forward to live this righteous life that glorifies God? That's what we will start to process, and we will be giving you, as we get to the end of this study, we will be giving you daily, um, a daily to-do list that will help you apply in a practical manner these truths that you're going to learn that will assist you in uh, allowing your faith to work in love. Uh, what is the vision through this study? We vision a community of believers living a self-controlled life through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to live a righteous life, it must be done through the power of the Holy Spirit as you apply your faith to the knowledge that you have acquired in the Word of God. That's why we are going through so much uh, uh, effort to make sure we supply you with the written word so that you can go into the word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you into your studies uh, and to the expanding of your knowledge uh, for the enlightenment of your mind to have a clear understanding of what God is teaching you. And this includes even the deep things of God. Also, our goal an objective. Uh, the, the goal is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's found in the Gospels, but this verse that I have here is Luke 10, 27. The desired objective, and if you're on the phone, and if I um, read a verse out to you, uh, if I move too fast before you get it down, um, just speak up and let me know, and I'll be glad to repeat it for you. Uh, the desired objective is to be more productive and useful in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus so that we will never stumble or fall away. That's supported by 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10, which is where our study will be coming from. 2 Peter 1, 5 and 10. That whole section through there, but those two verses basically um, gave the objective of that study. Today's situation. How did we get to where we are? A summary. Uh, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living uh, a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. The one who calls us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. That's Second Peter 1, 3, and 4. Uh, because this is the situation we have. If you are a born-again believer, this is how God has positioned you, and this is what he expects of you. Some would ask that how could we do such a thing because uh, whenever we start to talk about righteousness, the first response I usually get is, Jesus is the only one that's perfect. Well, because of Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, which talks about the new birth and what actually happens at that new birth, we receive a new heart that is tender and responsive to the word of God. God gives us a new spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us to make sure that we follow God's decrees and be careful to obey his regulations. That's the gist of Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. But if I could get someone to read 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, to support that in the New Testament, for those that think that the Old Testament is not necessary, but God's word is the same... Um, from beginning to end. Oh, yeah, and for those that are on the phone, if you want to uh, get in, uh, just d uh, dial star six to talk. For those that are on the phone, just press star six to talk if you have a question or want whatever. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. In his seed remain in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. This all happened at the new birth. It's not something that you have to grow into. It's not something that you have to be in a long time. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God does spiritual surgery on you. That's why you must make sure that you've been born again and you just didn't go through a process of being baptized and repeating some scriptures because it was the time to do this. Um, because if that's all it is, this surgery will not take place and you will not be equipped uh, to carry out God's will for your life. All right. How did we get here? How did we get to this place where we are talking about living a life of righteousness taking our relationship to the highest level that we can with God. Because after we recognize that all mankind uh, through our studies was created in the image and likeness of God, the breath that God breathed into mankind at creation, we discover that our discipline is love and our characteristics are joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
through this understanding, this allowed us to understand who and what sort of person we have become since birth and how we relate to others. It is through these truths that helped us determine what changes uh, have to be made in our mind to carry out God's plan for our life. This is very important because uh, there's a false assumption that because of grace, righteous living is not necessary or even possible. And this is how we got to this place through our studying of the Word of God, discovering who God really created us to be, discovering what His purpose for, for us is, and what he expects of us, and all that Jesus accomplished on the cross, we've come to understand that we must make some changes in the way we think and the way we do things uh, so that we can line up with the Word of God. Because when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we were declared righteous. We received Jesus' righteousness without doing anything to receive it other than putting faith in what he did on the cross. So when God sees born-again believers, he sees them as righteous, and it has nothing to do with anything that you've done. But because we have received this righteousness, God now requires us to live like we are righteous. He requires us to live up to that righteousness, and that's why he gave us everything that we need to be able to uh, follow that instruction. So that's how we got here. That's why we are having to study that's why we are committed to a life of righteousness <coughs> because that is what God expects of us and that is what obedience to God looks like. Um, any questions concerning that point? Because like I said, a lot of people struggle when we start to talk about living righteously. But understand, we're not talking about living righteous on our own power. We understand that it's through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We are not talking about trying to earn our righteousness. This has nothing to do with the scripture that says all of our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. That scripture in its proper context was, was reminding us why all mankind needs to be born again. Because on our best day, our righteousness is nothing but rat, rat, um, filthy rags to say that we can't earn righteousness. We are not talking about earning our righteousness. We have already received our righteousness through Jesus Christ and our faith in what he did on the cross. God called us righteous. Just like we were born messed up the first time and we had nothing to do with it, through this new birth we are born righteous and we have nothing to do with it either. But just like in our first birth, we automatically bent towards sin. Now because of our new birth, we are supposed to automatically bend toward righteousness. But it requires us to reprogram our mind and apply the principles and truths that God has given us in his word that the Holy Spirit will empower us to carry out. Make sure we understand that. Um, So, what are the spiritual truths to be applied as we move forward? What are the truths that need to be applied? Here they are right here. Okay, for through the Spirit by faith, we are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. The hope of the believer is to become righteous. And we know that process starts once we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior because we learn through earlier scriptures that God is at work. And all of those that he has predestined, he's, he's transforming us into the image of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ each day. That's found in Galatians 5, 5, 6. Faith working through love for those of you that are on the phone. Uh, spiritual truths that you must that must be applied for us to move forward in this endeavor. Galatians 5, 5, 6 is one of those truths. Galatians 5 Verses 5 and 6.
All right, another truth that needs to be applied in your mind as you are moving forward. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, verses 3 and 4. Second truth that you must have established in your mind. 1 John 5, 3 and verse 4. And another point, anyone that wants to receive uh, uh, these slides, once we go over them, just go to the website and put in your name and email, and I will email it to you. The third principle, the third truth that must be applied as we are moving forward in this process, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Fourth principle, a fourth truth that we must be applied in our thinking to move forward in this endeavor. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. These are all spiritual truths that you must apply in your mind to move forward and live in a righteous life for God because these are all part of the foundation that you must stand on without wavering when you're moving forward in your transformation. Fifth principle, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Galatians 5. 16 through 18. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. All truths that you must apply in your mind and stand on without wavering or doubting. All right. Another truth that you must apply. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. Because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Also, if anyone out there I'm breaking up and you can't understand, uh, please, uh, if you're on the line, type it in or unmute yourself and tell me. And if you're on the phone, um, star six, so you can talk and tell me.
So these are all truths that we must have. This is the foundation for moving forward. These are God's expectations. These will not change. They transcend time. This is the whole purpose of Jesus coming to restore us back to this place which we say we want to live. <clears throat> so the recommendation, what do we recommend to move forward? The first thing is uh, the strategy is going to have to be faith working through love. Why faith working through love? Because it's only through faith that you can please God. It takes faith to walk in obedience to the word of God. That faith releases God's blessing, releases God's help in our life. And understanding that love is the thing that is going to motivate you and drive you because to love God is to obey God. And if you say you love God, that's characterized by obedience to his word if you are a child of God. And these are the benefits. Number one, you will be strengthened in your viability, stability, and effectiveness as a believer. That's the benefit. You will be strengthened in your viability. For those on the phone, it's V-I-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y. Viability stability, and effectiveness as a believer. That's why we are moving forward. We want to put a strategy in place that's going to make us effective. Viability is your ability to use the Word of God as the basis for your decision-making. That's called spiritual worship. Romans 12, 1 through 3. which means being transformed from the world's way of doing things. Obedience is how we worship God. Stability is your ability to discern what is of God and what is not. That's spiritual maturity, which can only be accomplished through practicing righteousness. Effectiveness. Effectiveness refers to your ability to live a righteous lifestyle. That's called faithfulness. If you're on the phone and you didn't get those, I'll be glad to repeat them if you like. Just star six to chime in. Just allowing for a few minutes for anyone that may Hello? want. Yes. Okay. Um, effectiveness it says uh, refers to your ability to live a righteous life. Yeah. And that's summed up in faithfulness. Yeah. So your faithfulness as far as you adhering to the word of God or walking walking um walking your life according to the word of God or your uh, your application of the word of God to your life that's when you become an effective christian when you start to apply the word of God to your life but it takes faithfulness to do that because the word that you have to stand on goes totally against the grain in your human nature and the way your mind thinks. So it's going to cause you to walk in places that don't make sense to the human nature or your mind majority of the time. And we can open the phone lines for a little discussion because we've gone through a little information 
Um, but we want to make sure that everybody's understanding these principles, these truths, and how they fit into your process of living each day. Because we want to develop a flow of thought that flows uh, from beginning to end in your understanding. Mm -hmm. To have a clear picture of what you're doing and what it looks like and what it takes to actually bring that picture to uh, to fruition. Okay. Hello? Yes. All right. So... All right, so with the viability, that's going to be your ability to to um, use the word of God as far as your decision making. So yeah. it's like, it's like, okay, I'm aware of what the word of God says. So this is my process for. This is why I make the decision that I make. Yeah, it becomes the standard for your decision making. Okay, and then so then the effectiveness is just applying that. Is applying it because you know the standard, but you got to choose whether you're gonna walk according to the standard. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that know the word of God, but they struggle with applying it in their life, and that's one of the reasons we're going to this study is to show you how to actually apply it effectively. Okay. And then that's where the stability comes in, right? Right. Because that stability comes from practicing righteousness, which allows you to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Anyone else? Because we want to make sure everyone is clear. It doesn't make sense to move forward if you're not totally clear on what it is we're discussing and who knows you may have a question that someone else has but uh because we're online someone you may be a little shy to speak out because this is not about what you know it's about attaining the information but understanding it as we move forward and remember those on the phone you can star six to chime in All right, if you still, but you it's still open to chime in. I'm getting ready to move on, but chime in at any moment if you have a question or if you've been struggling trying to get on and you finally got it, still chime in to uh, ask your question. So what do we do next? We have the recommendation. We have the uh, truths that we need to apply. How do we move forward? Well, the next thing we have to start working on is building up your faith. Because remember, without faith, it is impossible to do anything that you know. Without faith, it is impossible to do the truths that you know. And the action items we're going to look at will be 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 is where we will be headed. And as we go over there, could I get someone to read those verses for us, please? His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very very great and precious promise so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires for this very reason make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control um, perseverance and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and mutual affection, love. You want me to read the next one? Hello? Hello? 
Uh, yes. Uh, go down to verse 11 for me, please. I had myself muted and forgot to turn me back on. Excuse okay. me, audience. <laughs> All right. Um, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been clean, cleansed from their past sin. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see what it says? And this is this is why this is very important. Coming from the Word of God. You know, you know, everybody talks about God's grace and all the things that God has done. But he lets us know that he's given us everything that we need for life and godliness here in this age. And it comes through true knowledge of God. true knowledge that true knowledge is the word of god not what i think not what you think not what whoever thinks not my opinion not your opinion is through your true knowledge of his word true knowledge of god and his purpose for you and how and why he created us and he created us to live a life of righteousness to represent his character here on earth. And he's given us everything that we can to, that we need to but take up the divine nature, the godly nature. Remember, we saw that he created us in his own image and likeness with the ability to represent his character through our thoughts and our um, decision-making. That's the word of God. These are the things we have to be clear on and it takes faith to carry these things through. And remember, we talked about saving faith gets you in, but saving faith is not working faith. Saving faith's work is to get you in the body. Now that you're in the body, you're growing into your knowledge and understanding of God's word. Now he's going to require you to build your faith to apply that word. Well, someone may ask, well, how would I know how well I need to build my faith? It's simple. When you come to circumstances and situations, and when you look at what the word says you're supposed to do, are you able to do it? Do you look at the word and say, this is what the word says, this is what I'm going to do, regardless of the consequences? That's a representation of the level of faith that you have. You have faith to walk in the truth that you know. Another scenario, you come into a situation, um, just give you a real life one. You've been late for work several times. The boss has told you, you'll be late one more day, you're going to get fired. You wake up the next day, lo and behold, you're going to be late. Well, the scripture teaches that we must be truthful and obedient. So that means that you're supposed to wake up, go to work, tell the boss what happened, even if it requires you to lose your job. But what most people do is they'll either stay out, go to the doctor, get a doctor's excuse, Go to work and say, that's why I didn't come in the day before. That's lying. That's not faithfulness. God tells us to be truthful. Because there's consequences that come with our actions. And a lot of times when we are brought into situations, we won't do what is right because of the price that we may have to pay. That is the very way you give away your blessings. And you start serving the enemy. You move out on his territory. Which moves you further away from God. 
at that point, you saw that you did not have the faith to tell the truth to glorify God, whether you were afraid of losing your job, losing your home, losing your family, losing whatever, but whatever it was, it prevented you from doing what you know to be right as a child of God. You go to the grocery store. You give the person $20. You spent $17 worth of, uh, you spent $17. They give you back a $10 bill. Unfortunately, to most of the religious circles, they have the audacity to call that a blessing. That was a test <clears throat> to see would you be honest because it is called stealing. That is not a blessing. But it showed that you did not have a faith, enough faith or love for God to do what was right. Because faith requires us to do what is right. So that's how you can determine what level of faith you have in any circumstance or situation. Any questions or thoughts on that before we move forward or conversation? Because we're talking about building up our faith and we need to know what that looks like. And we need to know where our faith is so we'll know where it needs to be strengthened at. So, as I said, if you're on the phone, you can start six to chime in. And if you're online, you can just unmute yourself and feel free. You may be, you may have a question that would free someone else or a comment that would free someone else that's thinking the same thing but not, doesn't have quite the faith to be bold enough to speak it online with others listening. <laughs> All right, in verse 5, we are told to add moral excellence to our faith. Moral excellence is the ability to live that quality of life that makes you stand out as excellent. It means doing what is right for the right reasons and in the spirit and character of God, but not in a boisterous or flamboyant way. So how do you add moral excellence to your faith? What does it look like? Look at 1 John 3, 7, and 8, and if I can have someone to read that. Little children. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does it, that um, does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so how do you add more excellence to your faith? You read that. How do you add more excellence to your faith? Anybody? By practicing righteousness. By practicing righteousness. Why is practicing righteousness so important? Anybody out there in webinar land? Because if you're not practicing righteousness, you're sinning, and sin, from, sin comes from the devil. Okay, if you're not practicing righteousness, you're sinning. What else? Anybody else out there? Why is practicing righteousness so important? And because through practicing righteousness, you're, um, you're training yourself to practice. 
um, through practice of righteousness, you um, you start developing those um, attitudes that you need to build up your faith. Okay. Anyone else out there? Shot. Why is practicing righteousness so important? You know, because one of the biggest things I hear when you're dealing with believers is not really knowing whether this is of God or not, or not a lot of times. Not sure whether this is of God or whether it's not, you know, should I or shouldn't I. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through uh, 14 helps us understand why practicing righteousness is so important. Get someone to read that. Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you are to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. See what it says? Solid food, which is the, uh, the meat of the word of God. And it's through practicing the word of God you're training yourself in righteousness. And the reason that righteousness is so important, that is the only way that you're going to be able to be sure whether this or that is of God or not. So what does it look like to be on milk? Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through uh, 3, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teaching about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying against, again, the foundation of repentance from acts that led to death and of faith in God. Instructions about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. See what it says? Now, this is what he says, the elementary things of, if you're a person that's always talking about have faith in God, you're still on milk. If you're a person that's constantly talking about do's or don'ts, you know, the law, you can't do this, you can't do that, you're still on milk. If you're still talking about laying on of hands, you know, the, you know, constantly focusing on the resurrection from the dead, you know, or eternal judgment, you know, all of that's basic elementary. <laughs> that's milk. The meat of the word is what we are talking about now. Applying the word to your life that you can live a righteous lifestyle because you are able to discern what's of God and what is not. But it first starts with applying the basic stuff and understanding what it means. And so often as you move across the religious circle, uh, people be in dire straits and having tough situations, uh, but the average professing believer is not able to give you any serious, in-depth counsel on how to handle your situation. They throw these little verses out there. Have faith in God. You know, God is good all the time. Just hold on. God is, may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. Just religious placebos that really don't um, imp impact a person in a way that they can actually uh, better their life and their quality of life because that's milk. There's no maturity there. And at that place, you can't even teach someone else on how to serve God. But the mature person is the one that practices the word of God on a daily basis, which trains his senses. And we are talking about being delivered from that 
uh, those desires and things that were trained in the ways of Satan. Now we're retraining our senses and everything about us in the ways of God. And that's why we're at this place that we are, are where we are now. And we're at the basis where it takes building up your faith because these are the things that you will have to add which allow you to walk in obedience to God's word, but also show you what it looks like. Any questions or comments in that area? Because this is very important. You, you constantly hear that all the time, you know, uh, but no one's able to sit down and actually counsel you through from the word of God to stand on the principles of God. And a lot of times you get counsel that is the counsel of the world. Um, I was just thinking, you know, um, if someone was to um, get this part of the lesson now, um, mm -hmm. it's more of, like you said, on solid food, but if mm -hmm. they skip the elementary truths, it would be, uh, what you call it, detrimental? Actually, to, oh, go ahead. Actually, this is what you're supposed to get the day you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Instructions on how to live. Mm -hmm. that, that, that faith in God. See, that's that saving faith. This is the saving faith. This is the stuff that gets you in. You know, the repentance from dead works. You no know, faith toward God. You no know, instruction about washings and the laying on of hands. And we know the washings is talking about being cleansed from your sins. And the laying on of hands is an acknowledgement that I'm in agreement that you are uh, in whatever it is you're doing. And that agreement is actually made through the Holy Spirit coming to dwell inside you. And then those that are around you see the change that is taking place in your life. See, all of that is the saving faith part right here. This is the stuff that gets you in. And anyone that's been a professing believer, uh, usually has this part, whether in a clear understanding or not. But the day you accept Jesus, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, I'm supposed to take you to Romans chapter 6 and start telling you what's expected of you. Take you to 1 John that we just read to show you why it's all possible and how it all can take place. Take you to Ezekiel to show you what happened at the new birth. What this does, it takes away all the excuses of why I can't walk in righteousness. It throws that verse, that con that excuse out the window that Jesus is the only one perfect. But you've, if you've been in church a long period of time and you've never gotten this, and you want nothing, you've had nothing but the milk. Uh, that's why your life is ineffective. Um, you struggle in your obedience to God. Uh, you're really not a strong witness for God because you don't have any power, which is what Second Timothy, I believe, talks about. About uh, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. Any other comments or questions? And uh, just another thing on what you just said, if you do have that saving faith and you're really sincere about your relationship with God, even though you may not have received this level of teaching, it'll all start to make sense to you once you hear it. If that saving faith is real and you're truly born again and your desire is really to be what God has called you to be, now, if you just have saving faith and you think you're somewhere that you're not, when you start hearing something like this, you're going to have too much pride to receive it because it's going to require you to make too many changes in your life. And that's going to paint a picture of you because of pride that you don't want other people to know. That's strong evidence that you weren't truly born again. Well, why would you say such a thing? Uh, uh, for, I think it's First John that talks about that we are from God. And those who are of God hear us. 
anybody know what that verse is? Let's see. You are from God. Little children have overcome. Uh, that's First John chapter four. Verses 1 through 6, if I could have someone read that. And I'm glad you asked that question because we we don't want to be deceived between those that are truly born again and those that think they've been born again. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus, Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the, from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. You get what I'm saying? Any truly born again believer receives those that are of God, regardless of what the instruction is. They may not necessarily understand it, but they'll receive it and they will allow the Holy Spirit to lead them in it. Because it's not you giving your opinion, you're taking them into the Word of God. And that person that doesn't receive the Word of God is a person that's not born again because Scripture says it's foolishness to them. Um, does somebody know where that is, that a carnal mind cannot receive the things of God because it's foolishness to them? As 1 Corinthians, I believe, or 2 Corinthians. See, and that's why we study the Word of God. The Word of God helps you understand everything clearly. Everyone that approaches you, every situation that you're in, every circumstance the Word of God, through practicing the Word of God, it makes everything clear to you. So if you are truly born again, you are sharing the Word of God with people that are professing to know God, and they are not receiving it, God says that's how you know that they are not of God. Because if they are of God, they will receive you. Because like spirits uh, uh, connect with each other. Did that answer your question? Can you all still hear me? That was for me. Rashad, yeah. did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, we got like a... Um... So I was talking to Sharon with this person the other day. Um, uh, been going to church for a while, for a long time, professed to be a, a, a believer. Shared with me that at this point, though, I mean, been singing in the choir, doing a number of things in the church for I don't know how many years now, maybe five, six years more. But actually, he was sharing with me that he started, just started going through discipleship. But he said every day is a fight. I mean, like hating to go to the class, hating, um, I mean, he's not like really hating, but dreading, fighting tooth and nail. He said every day is a battle just to get there. But then it was, I, I was sharing, you know, that, uh, you know, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. You know, just trying to talk with him. But I, I, I was sharing with him, I could kind of understand, relate to where you were. I said, because even before, what happened with me was once I had that encounter with God, and I said, I can remember just like it was yesterday, that made me have more desire and want to uh, learn more about God. I said, but until that happened, man, I, I, I'm kind of lost for words right there. The way you are, I can relate to it. But basically, I, I, I was saying that, you know, is he truly, but he said he's saved. So how can you say you're really saved if you don't? 
I mean, so that, that's the thing we've been discussing. Saving faith got him in. But there's no power to walk in obedience to God. See, he, he's, he got in, but now he's like an infant. He hasn't been trained in the things of God. But the fact that he's still going is evidence that he has a desire. And the process is going to reveal the truth because it, it could just as well be, you know, it's like that, that saving faith gets you in. <clears throat> but that's also a part when you look back at the four souls. Some, all of them received the word of God gladly. But when the issues of life and the struggles and the, um, what's the word, uh, people you know, beating down on you and the tribulations and the trials started to show up, a lot of people fall away because they weren't really saved. They were operating, they were in love with the idea of being saved because of like basically eternal fire insurance. No one consciously, I think, wants to go to hell. And a lot of people come to the Lord for the wrong reason. You know, and that won't save you. It'll make you perform. But it comes to a point that your power on your own runs out. You become frustrated, burnt out, you know, resentful. And it is obvious that he's making himself go. Whereas if you're truly born again, that's supposed to be a joy for the word of the Lord. You know, and then this is what this situation would help play out in his mind. It's not for me to say or not say that he's saved or not saved. You know, it's no one, that, only God knows that. But we have been told by the word not to believe every spirit, but try the spirit by the spirit. And we just gather data, data and just observe. Because we know that if you're truly born again, when you get that opportunity to move toward God, uh, the Holy Spirit will lead you once again, going back to the new birth. God put things in place to make it impossible not to follow him. Because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, and he gave us a receptive heart and a new spirit. So, I mean, the twos are there, so. There's no evidence, but that's between the individual and God because God knows the heart. And it could be the process that has started him along that journey. Can I ask you a question or give you any uh, insight on it? Yes. Okay. Anyone else out there? We're coming down to the end of our time. Uh, this is a good place to stop as any, um, but this is where we'll be going, working on building our faith, and hopefully that the scriptures that we're given will allow you to see what that looks like, because that's why um, we want everybody to kind of participate so that we can uh, get some discussion on what it is we are studying. All hearts and minds clear if no one has anything else before we close. We will close with a word of prayer. But uh, before we close up, remember the things that we discussed. Go over them and study them between now and the next time we come together. Uh, come back with some questions or some insight. It will be much appreciated because you never know who is going to help. All right. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together in your word tonight. We ask you to bless it. Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to you and ask you to just open our hearts and our minds to come into a deeper understanding of these truths that we may start the process of reprogramming our mind in these truths that we may start to walk in them in a manner that glorifies God, that the world will know that hope and deliverance is here as they see our growth and deliverance. We thank you for this time, dear Lord, and we ask you to continue to lead us, Holy Spirit, to serve God in spirit and in truth. And as your authority, we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. I'd like to say good night to everybody. I thank you for joining us. Um, 
I'll stay on for a minute if somebody had a question, but if not, we will. Uh, I'll tell you what, I won't stay on for a minute because I'm going to challenge you to have your questions during class so everybody can hear. Everybody have a good night. Good night, good night. Good night. Good night, good night. Yes. Yeah, did you see you was hanging on? No, I'm no I'm not. Oh, okay. But you can always call me back if you like. All right. All right. Bye.